Last night marked the seventh Democratic debate and the last debate before the voting actually starts in Iowa. White House hopefuls touched down in the Hawkeye state to make their case for the presidency. Before we get into deep data, let's do a little bit on what you guys thought about last night. And for the record, let's just let everybody know, you uh, do do some work for Tom Steyer, um, although you are not here representing the Steyer campaign. Well, I, I'll start with, I think, I think Tom did great last night. <laughs> <laughs> but overall, I, I think we saw, uh, we, we saw candidates present a very different vision of America. I think it was quite interesting that we didn't see quite as contentious of a debate as many people may have expected. I was expected. surprised by that. I was surprised by that. I think some of the second choice rules of Iowa could control Contribute to that—that that you don't really want to want to upset too many of too many of your of your of your uh, colleagues um, supporters because we, you might need their you might need them to second choice you. But I also think you know I'm I'm a huge fan of a very rigorous and a very crowded primary. I think that our crowded our crowded stage has has led to much stronger debate performances from everybody up there. We saw them sharpening their their message, giving a much more succinct vision. But, but, uh, but I, I was expecting it to be a little bit more contentious, a little bit more rigorous. You know, but the question is states. here, the question is also, are these candidates getting vetted enough? Right. Right? Like, one of the things that happens in a primary is you get a lot of the dirt out, right? That's you get right. it on the table, mm -hmm. and the, the population is able to sort of suss through it, and then candidates develop responses to all that dirt, and then you know what you're going to face with going into the fall. If everybody plays too nice, you never actually mm -hmm. get tested. Yeah. And I think last night's debate was a good debate uh, on the merits, but it's not something that's going to change the field at all. Mm. Uh, Democrats right now are actually pretty positive on the field. They like a lot of the candidates. Uh, last night's debate isn't going to change that. You know, uh, Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden are sort of the national front runners. In Iowa, it's a bit more complicated. I think it's going to stay more complicated all the way up until uh, the, the caucuses in uh, three weeks, a little less than three weeks now. Um, but you're right, but the question actually becomes in a post-truth, post-fact world where everything's fake news, does it matter that you're vetted or not if you can just steamroll over criticism? You know, I, I, I have to say that, that it absolutely does, right? I mean, we are going to see our, whoever our eventual nominee is on the Democratic side, we're going to see them bombarded with, uh, with, with attacks, with, with reminders of their record, and frankly, I don't believe that the Democratic electorate has been exposed to those records enough, especially from our two front runners. And frankly, I, I'm a bit concerned. You think the two front runners are Biden and Bi Biden and Bernie? I believe are, are are the two national front runners. I would agree with that. And I don't know that the Democratic electorate has been quite as exposed to, to some of the more contentious parts of their record as we could have been in this primary. And and I think that can matter in the margins in terms of turnout. Um, but the antipathy to Trump among the Democratic Party is so strong. I don't know unless it comes out that, you know, Sanders killed somebody or Biden killed somebody or something like that. I don't think it's going to matter that much because as long as they're not Trump, Democrats are going to stay uni unified behind them. Yeah, they're going to find that out. They're going to say, well, why did they kill him? <laughs> right. Well, you know, there's probably a I mean, good I, reason for it. I, I'll push there a little bit because a lot, a lot of, you know, there was the same vitriol towards Trump existed in 2016 that a lot of a lot of Democrats knew that he was a an existential threat to the things that we consider mm -hmm. important. And frankly, we still saw 10 percent of, of, of young minorities splint 13 percent splinter third party. We still have the same Trump at the top of the ticket and we still are, are being for are being uh, are, are going to be. Um, Facing the same forces with our, with whoever our nominee is. So this is this is the perennial danger of the conversation about in, among the Democratic Party is how is it that people expect the the fall election to go? Are you more worried about winning over uh, whatever independent voters that are out there that might be watching this mm -hmm. and feel less interested, or are you worried about having a candidate that can make sure every Democrat who cares, every Democrat maybe who doesn't even care, doesn't think they care, shows up in the election in the fall? Right. And you know, Bernie obviously is making the case that he's the guy who can do that. Um, but does anybody else have a chance of? Doing that kind of inspiration. I mean, I think Elizabeth Warren is also trying to make that case. I think this is why she so uh, successfully injected gender onto that stage yesterday. I think that obviously gender bias is going to be a huge is going to play a huge role in this in this election. We've seen it play play a role in 2016. But you know, I wonder because women have never really seemed to be gender voters. I mean, the country is 270 years old, or 240 Absol years old. I absolutely, we've never agree. had a woman president. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. and, and in 2016, we saw white women. The majority of white women support Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton, over right. the historic candidacy. And we've got a lot of data that suggests that Democrats are going to support the nominee. It doesn't really matter what their identity is. Uh, we have a recent Washington Post poll with African Americans, for instance, that suggests 
African Americans care much less about supporting a black candidate than they support can a candidate that can beat Trump. Yeah, well, part of that is African Americans had a black president. But here's the real key. I mean, you can talk about this from your research. My anecdotal research is black Americans, especially older black Americans, are as pragmatic a group of people as you will ever meet in your life. And I'll tell you what, they also do not trust that America is going to ultimately do the right thing by them on a consistent basis. On a consistent basis. So um, what they believe is the only chance they have to stop this person that they think is despicable is to pick an older white guy who can go out there yep. and solve this problem. And I think we see that in their overwhelming support for Joe Biden, who is the old white guy in the race, seems like a safe candidate and is getting support of half of the African American community. And then you see very often their, their second choice ends up being Bernie, yeah. which you would think ideologically doesn't make any sense. That's exactly but if you right. take the ideology out of it and you think about it, this is identity politics flipped in a different direction, mm -hmm. right? Because this is African Americans saying, no, 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 white people are playing identity politics right, right now and they are only going for white people and so right. let's take the black people out of this and let's pick a white person who can be our champion. And, and in many ways we've seen this Democratic primary do just that. I mean mm -hmm. we, there was an, an all-white debate stage yesterday it's with 25 percent of the Democratic electorate being black and, and 40 plus percent being people of color. If we wanted someone of color on that stage there are enough Democratic <laughs> Democrats right. in this in this electorate to have kept someone on that stage. We do see them being quite pragmatic in their decisions. But frankly, I mean, I think there's, there's actually a lot of affinity and trust towards, towards, towards Joe Biden sure. that I don't think that we, that we give him enough credit for when we say he's just the, the best bet to be done. All right, so here's my question about Biden on this front. I'm gonna get back to your African-American poll. Um, so African-Americans obviously are gonna matter a lot in South Carolina, mm -hmm. obviously gonna matter a lot across the South um, in some of those Super Tuesday states. When you get to the big states like Wisconsin and Michigan, also big chunk of those, um, the state electorates. Um, Biden is running on an inevitability, I'm the guy who can win, I'm a winner campaign. Right. What happens if Biden doesn't win in Iowa, in fact, he could come in fourth place, he goes to New Hampshire and doesn't win. Mm -hmm. He doesn't win in Nevada because maybe Bernie is able to take. Does, does, does that base hold by the time he gets to South Carolina if he's a two or three time loser? So that is, a, that is I think, the operative question for the next month is, does his theory of his candidacy, that he's the electable guy, hold up if he doesn't actually win elections? Among African Americans in our Washington Post Ipsos survey, we found that African Americans are supporting him because of that pragmatism you pointed out. But also, they do feel that affinity sure. uh, mm -hmm. that you mentioned. The, the link to Obama is still very mm -hmm. strong and something that's very real. And I think that will hold up to an extent. But all of the white support for Joe Biden that I think is also pragmatic, that might disappear if one of the other candidates ends up being much more strong in those early states and presents that case. And then it adds in sort of the wrinkle of what happens with Bloomberg when we roll into Super Tuesday and the you know $100 million he's spending. Hey, people who watch this a lot know I think this. There's been this you know 2004 campaign, which was the last time Democrats tried to unseat a Republican. There was kind of a roving band of voters that just seemed to move between candidates mm -hmm. as each candidate was up. It was Lieberman at one point, and Wesley Clark at one point, and mm -hmm. Howard Dean at one point. And then uh, Kerry sort of mounted his comeback, and you saw those voters shift to Kerry okay. so fast. And every day they went to Kerry, they, all the other candidates went down as Kerry went up. Right. He won New Hampshire, and the game was pretty much effectively over. People lived for a few more weeks, but the candidacy I think is pretty much decided. I think it's exactly right. I'm, but I also think that you know that, that losing the inevitability factor could erode Biden's support. But I also think that you're going to start seeing that more rigorous vet happen as we start to move into South Carolina and Nevada. And we've seen race injected into, I'm sorry, actual race, yeah. <laughs> ethnicity. I mean, Nina injected. Turner came for Biden That's hard exactly right. in the South Carolina State newspaper. That's exactly right. We, saw, we even saw uh, in 2008, we saw Clinton and Obama injecting Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. Actually injecting race in South Carolina, <laughs> right. um, so I do expect that some of the that some of the issues, and more importantly, some of Biden's record to become uh, more more on the forefront as we as we move into South Carolina and, and Nevada, and voters of color start to weigh in a little bit heavier. Race is such a big deal in South Carolina. Even on the Republican side, they put race in it. I remember when they attacked John McCain long ago because mm -hmm. he said he had a black daughter because he's adopted a daughter yeah, yeah. from overseas. This is an amazing thing in South Carolina. All right, so you guys are doing a bunch of research. I mean, let's talk about the African American poll. Um, You've also got some other stuff that's coming out this week. That that's right. Be interesting. That's right. Yeah. So the we did a survey with the Washington Post and Ipsos uh, with African Americans nationwide survey, uh, probability sample, so gold standard stuff. Um, we actually just released the first half of it on Sunday. Uh, we'll be releasing the second half of it with the Post to this upcoming weekend. Um, the first half was focused on the horse race and the ballot. Uh, 
Biden is clearly the front runner, almost like 46, 50 percent, 48 percent. Like yeah, uh, basically half. Sanders is in next, like you mentioned, which is interesting. And then everyone else, single digits. I'm, I'm sure you uh, did, did you do early state polling there as well? We didn't, we didn't do okay. early state pullouts. No, it was just some, some of that early poll. state polling may, may also show Steyer gaining quite a bit of momentum with voters of color <laughs> well, in South Carolina. And I think that people are talking about Steyer um, and we're going to circle back to this. But I think people are talking about Steyer because he's been really clear um, in terms of why he's running. And, it, you know, those of us who've been in the media business know a lot of times when you're doing advertising, that advertising doesn't show up next week or two weeks from now. Mm -hmm. But it's like That's that right. ad you hear in the car when you're driving around right. and before you know it, you just know the jingo, yep. know That's the jingle. Right. That's right. And I think his advertising for the last couple of years about impeachment made him relevant to people. Right? I think that's right. I mean, Donald Trump is a fake and a fraud has become a jingle in people's hands. You, know? <laughs> well, getting, you actually hear Tom's voice when you when you hear fake and fraud. Like yeah. getting rid of Donald Trump is the number one issue for Democrats. Yeah. And like he's positioning himself real strong on that issue. He's been doing so for years. So that's that's important. It's something the rest of the field actually is sort of only talked about a little bit obliquely. So so that actually is a strong suit of his. He just needs to be able to get his name out there and see if that can catch uh, catch traction. This week you've got something with 538. And that's right. So the other thing we have is this after uh, today we're releasing uh, the 538 Ipsos uh, debate poll. So every debate we've been doing a survey where we talk to Democratic voters before the debate and then go back to those same individuals after the debate, ask them if they watched the show and then what they think of it. In this poll, we find that for the most part, debate watchers liked Elizabeth Warren's performance. Uh, she ended up uh, sort of being seen as having the strongest debate overall. Mm -hmm. And then everyone else is a little bit further down. Uh, Biden is seen as doing okay. Uh, Bernie Sanders is seen as doing okay. Buttigieg is seen as okay. Klobuchar is seen as having had a good debate, but she still just doesn't have enough people sort of paying attention to her to My I mom think, break through. Klobuchar. Well, I think that's her. She, I mean, she grew up in Michigan. She's like, she's, you know, the voice is very familiar. Right. And the whole personality is very familiar. I mean, that's Klobuchar's issue in a nutshell is like the people who know her like her a lot. Yeah. A lot of people don't know her though. That's her challenge. <laughs> she has not figured out a way to break through and get that widespread attention. All right. The last person I want to talk to before we get out of here is, um, is Michael Bloomberg. The Bloomberg campaign to me is one of the most interesting things happening in this cycle. Other people have tried to do this before in the past. The wait out the first couple of contests, mm -hmm. invest late mm -hmm. in, the, in the last one. We saw it on the Republican side before, we've seen it on the Democratic side. But nobody's done it willing to spend about a billion dollars. Right. I mean, there's one report that he's already spent $200 million so far. He's got 1,000 staffers in 33 states built all the way out, you know, past Super Tuesday now into some of these big states. Mm -hmm. um, and he's telling staffers that he's got Gonna, uh, yeah, until November. Keep them employed to November, and I'm hearing rumblings that he's paying them a lot of money. Yes, I've heard, I've heard those <laughs> same rumblings. I've confirmed some of those rumblings. Yeah, he's paying people <laughs> a lot of money more than most other Democratic That's campaigns. Right. So you were seeing people get out of as Kamala Harris drops out, as Cory Booker drops out. We're seeing some of their staff mm -hmm. move to Bloomberg. That some of these other campaigns thought they were going to have a chance right. to get. But well, frankly, the getting is just too good yeah. with That's the right. man from New York City. That's right. I mean, one, one thing I'd point out, and this is, it, it, Michael Bloomberg had a very sophisticated political operation before he decided to run for president. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a there's a lot of talent around him. There's a lot of uh, a, a lot of of of, uh, of organizational prowess around him, and I think that now him injecting this amount of money into it changes the field a bit. I do think that what happens in Iowa makes it play will, will make a big difference about whether or not Michael Bloomberg is running for president or if he's running to make sure Donald Trump does not remain president. Mm -hmm. Um, well, this is my question. Is this, a, is this a presidential campaign or is this a super PAC and drag, right? Is this just a super PAC that is running uh, as a candidacy so that he can spend as much money without having all the scrutiny that you might get? Well, and Bloomberg says his priority is keeping Trump from being the president. I believe him. I sure. think that is his goal. And he is, I think, probably the most savvy analyst of data or, uh, of all the presidential candidates. Right. I think he has meticulously thought through what his path could be to mm -hmm. be president. And if he doesn't see it materialize, he is willing to can pivot. It, can it work? I think it potentially could, but he's fighting with Joe Biden for a base. And it's not necessarily left or right. It's establishment versus anti-establishment. Mm -hmm. And if Biden is strong, Bloomberg is going to struggle to catch oxygen, find oxygen. I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure that he, that he can actually compete for the same voters as Joe Biden, specifically because Joe Biden's the, the strength of Joe Biden's base right now are voters of color, and I'm not well, sure. True. 
that Michael Bloomberg is going to be able to play with those voters, especially when— Stop and frisk matters. Listen, when yeah. folks on that stage start to bring up stop and frisk, I think, you know, there are black women all over the country that are going to get a little chill down their spine about what that means for their, for their, for their black But, students. you know, as we were talking a little earlier, I think the African-American community is somewhat pragmatic. And we saw in our post poll that his, the number of African-Americans who wouldn't consider voting for him at all was certainly a little bit higher than we saw with other candidates, but it was by no means disqualifying. So I don't think he's a first choice, but right. I think it could happen. I think it's the, the white supporters of Joe Biden, though, that are really Bloomberg's core constituency he's trying to go after. Yeah. So we're going to have to see. I think, the, I think the, the, the Bloomberg campaign rationale is the first four states are a mess. Nobody dominates out of those first four contests. And then that's when you can inject some new people in. The other person who's ar ar arguing that that may also be the case, Deval Patrick. Mm -hmm. And Deval Patrick, I'm hearing, is uh, doing events around the country. People are actually starting to show up at some of those events. Um, <laughs> he's starting to raise some money. Uh, and he's going to start going up with some ads pretty soon uh, to make his case. Mm -hmm. And now that he may be the only African, he is the only African-American left in the race, um, that he may get some looks, but he is banking that um, even more broadly, there's never been the total base of his support. He is banking that he can make a case that mm -hmm. he is a responsible exec executive mm -hmm. that he can trust with the mantle of leadership. I mean, look, with 60% with of the Democratic electorate still being swing, right, either undecided or not fully committed, there's absolutely room in this race for people to, to, to shop around. Mm -hmm. That said, I think that Michael Bloomberg's late entry into this race comes with some added benefits of name ID, of a very sophisticated political operation, and of a ton, and a, a ton of resources that he's injecting that, that I don't think Deval Patrick is bringing, is bringing to the, to the, to the, to the yeah, race. I'll tell you what, if Deval barrier. Patrick had Michael Bloomberg's money, he'd be the next president of the United States. Deval Patrick would be powerful <laughs> if he had a billion dollars to spend, <laughs> yes. That's I think a lot of people would be, though. <laughs> Thanks for watching Hill TV on YouTube. Be sure to click subscribe and hit the bell so you know when we post new videos. And head to thehill.com for all the latest political news.